my name's Sam. I'm from Open Data Manchester. I'm going to talk to you today about a project that we did in Stockport and hopefully give you some experiences that I hope the OSM community uh, will benefit from hearing about. So, um, firstly, what is Ma Open Data Manchester? Who are we? Um, so Open Data Manchester was established in 2010, actually one of the earliest sort of um, open data organizations in the UK at least. Um, and our mission is to promote a fairer and more equitable society uh, through the development of intelligent and responsible data practice across Greater Manchester, but also nationally and internationally. Um, so we advocate for local and national government data release. We run workshops, training, events, research. Uh, we develop initiatives looking at working with data, but we also promote organizations uh, doing good work with data. Um, we're a small organization, but we have a really wide community base with a diverse set of knowledge and skills. Um, so we do a lot of work around data standards, such as the open contracting data standard you might have heard about, the 360 giving data standard. We look at data governance, uh, rights, and we're developing a declaration for responsible and intelligent data practice. Um, but we're also interested in the Internet of Things. We run the Things North network in, in the UK. Um, but we also run a lot of monthly meetups, occasional hackathons, digging the data, um, that kind of thing. And also our Joy Diversion uh, meetups, which I'll share a little bit about in a minute. So we do a wide, a wide range of things. Um, so with Mapping Mobility Stockport, um, we aimed to map the experiences of those with mobility or accessibility impairments, um, looking at the routes and the strategies that they use to move in and out of Stockport Town Centre, the obstacles they came across, the barriers, but also the things that worked well as well. Um, the project was co-designed with local charity Disability Stockport and Age UK Stockport. Um, and was led by Open Data Manchester with Stockport Council as well, uh, with funding from the Open Data Institute. Um, I'm going to talk about sort of what we did, uh, what we found, and um, basically, you know, the need to sort of ensure that we have more inclusive um, uh, methodology in our mapping. So. This is a painting by L.S. Lowry. Some of you might know him. He is um, a northern a painter from northern north of the UK. As you can see, this isn't actually Stockport, but it's nearby. You can see, but there's like lots of steps, nice clean lines. Everything looks really nice and easy. But if you've ever been to Stockport, it's a little bit more like this. Um, it's quite confusing at first. There's lots of layers. I mean, this is actually me experimenting with a 360 camera, um, but I thought it gave a really good sense of one's experience of um, Stockport Town Centre at times. But a more serious example, um, this is this circle road here is called Marketplace, and it is next to the Marketplace, uh, so it's quite a busy area. Um, but this is what it really looks like. So it's not actually a straight line. There's lots of data points there potentially, um, but yet obviously it's mapped as a single line. Um, the point is the urban environment, um, it often includes lots of barriers like the ones you can see here that exclude people with restricted mobility. So that might be because of the topography, um, you know, historical planning, uh, just deterioration of the urban environment. Um, and some of these things might not actually be known to the local authority. Now, uh, as I say, this is not unusual, um, particularly for Stockport, uh, which is built over various levels. There's steep inclines, lots of stairs. It's not the most accessible uh, town centre um, so as I say, people with mobility impairments, particularly in Stockport, they are at the front line when it comes to negotiating these obstacles. But they often have their own routes that they take. They often have their own strategies that they use to get around the town centre. And most of this information isn't shared. It's contained well, tacitly within the communities themselves. Could be for a variety of reasons, particularly with the groups that I worked with. They, are not, they might use things like Google Maps, they, most of them probably ha haven't heard of OpenStreetMap before, so this kind of thing perhaps might not get picked up. Um, 
But this information, the routes, the strategies, the ways they move into and out of the town centre, it could be a resource that could be really invaluable in helping others who face similar challenges, particularly if you're visiting the town, um, as well as helping local authorities um, identify where interventions need to be made. Or in the case of Stockport, they're redeveloping their town centre, so we were able to feed directly into that. So as I say, uh, we worked with Disability Stockport, Age UK Stockport, we designed a series of workshops, and I guess mapping parties is kind of what we did, um, and which drew directly on their lived experience of the town centre. So workshops were sort of um, based around the Joy Diversion meetups that Open Data Manchester regularly runs throughout the year. If you were at the OSM, OpenStreetMap UK AGM last year, I know some of you here were, you, you'll be familiar with Joy Diversion. In a Joy Diversion participants, we take maps of Manchester and Salford from the 1800s, um, and people look at what's changed, look at what's interesting, they propose expeditions, uh, form teams, and they basically just go out and see what they can find. They might do a bit of mapping, or they might just go and explore the city. Um, it's primarily, it's a fun meetup. It's designed for the whole family. Um, but it is also about helping people recognize and claim ownership of their city. You know, the streets are theirs. Um, but the format provided a really good starting point for the Map and Mobility project. So we designed two types or streams of workshops, which were designed to account for the different needs and requirements of the project participants. Um, the first type of workshop consisted entirely of indoor sessions. Uh, we made use of high resolution printed maps provided by Stockport Council. You can kind of see them see him there. Um, and we began basically by discussing areas and generating a list of obstructions and issues and beginning to identify particular areas of note. Um, so. Uh, yeah, so this is the large high-res map of Stockport, which were provided by the council. We invited people literally to scribble onto the map. So remember that many of these uh, only might have only really used things like Google for search. They might not be digital at all. So this information was directly then fed to Stockport Council and all relevant information into OpenStreetMap as well. Here's um, an example of one of the workshops in action. This is Age UK Stockport. As you can see, it was generating a lot of discussion. And these discussions naturally led into a deeper dive into the problem areas themselves. Um, participants began to share their experiences in much more detail and describe routes that they uh, take on a regular basis. This is a session from Disability Stockport. Um, we had a variety of, of, of disabilities. So we had uh, wheelchair, sort of multiple levels of blindness, and one gentleman with quite acute neurological problems where he's fine unless he's going downhill. So we were really starting to draw on some, you know, uh, various um, mobility impairments beyond just sort of wheelchairs. Um, so this is an example of, yeah, of another workshop, but which led into the second type of workshop, which was outdoor expeditions um, with the workshop participants. And it was from these that we got the most uh, information. So we went out with people one-on-one -on -one or in small groups, and we had digital recorders taking lots of photographs, and we asked the participants to take the routes that they normally take to travel on a sort of daily or weekly basis, and they, we just got them to narrate their experience in sort of first person to literally tell us what was going on. Now, trips were weather dependent. Um, due to the time and scope of the project, we had to do this between January and March. I don't know if you know Manchester, or support in January or March. There was a lot of rain, there was a lot of snow, so we perhaps didn't get to go out as much as we would like. So this is where we fell back onto the first type of workshop. So we would get the routes and I would go out in my cold taking photos and taking pictures like that and then bringing them back for further discussion. But we did try to go out as much as we possibly could. Um, yeah, I mean, the main great thing about the outdoor expeditions is that they were able to convey their experience of accessing Stockport. And as I say, we got a broad range of um, impairments from physical, neurological, visual, that kind of thing. So, um, 
what did we find? So, uh, yeah, we gained some, I mean, personally, some incredibly invaluable insights, which I want to sort of share. There's the obvious things, dropped curbs, that kind of thing in front of driveways. People in uh, OpenStreetMap will be very familiar with this kind of thing. Uh, things like steps into shops, you know, these were the standard things we expected to find. This is one of my favorites. Uh, this is a dropped curb with tactile paving leading to a raised curb with no tactile paving on a really busy bus route into the town center. Okay, so <laughs> um, luckily this is part of the, the, the bus, it is the area is being redeveloped and I can confirm that Stockport Council are gonna be sorting this out. So it was a really positive outcome for the project there. Um, but just things I, did, I didn't realise, maybe some of you might not realise, like different, in the UK we have different coloured tactile paving for different things. So the red is where there is a controlled crossing, so you press a button, and the yellow is where there is no controlled crossing, so that is obviously really useful. But in some areas of heritage they use grey, and if you are partially sighted, grey is a very difficult, um, difficult colour to, to sort of to, to work with. Um, particularly interesting point relating to the use of tactile paving. Um, whilst useful for those with visual impairments, they can actually become a hazard for a wheelchair user. Um, so essentially the, the, the chair's front wheels, the little jockeys, can become caught on the bumps and cause the person to be thrown from their chair. So uh, John, who is a very, very able-bodied, very able person, regularly comes out of his wheelchair because of tactile paving. So, and in areas like this, where tactile paving stretches the width of the pavement, it's meant to guide the person with visual impairment to the crossing, it becomes even more difficult for a wheelchair user. So it's, what's really interesting that is, you know, what is assistive for one person becomes an obstacle for another. Um, and I think that's a really, really important thing to note. It also raised lots of questions around things like this. So areas of bad paving or broken paving. So obviously we use in the UK things like Fix My Street. I, I don't know if that's outside the UK or not. Um, but this is an area that has a river running underneath it. So while the paving is, will be fixed, it's an area that regularly has problems. So it, there was a whole question about how do you map, should that, you, don't, you can't map each individual broken paving, but the area itself perhaps can be flagged in some way. And what about this? So this looks fine at the moment, but come summer, that's loads of brambles. That whole paving will be covered with brambles. So, <laughs> so suddenly that becomes problematic. Um, and this is just an example of the high street that is used regularly. You can see bollards, A boards taking up pavement space. Um, you know, could this be, how, how would you look at that? Bollards and lampposts, you know, are something more permanent. Here's another view. You can actually see a mobility scooter in the background um, zipping down a very busy road because he can't use the <laughs> pavement. Um, in fact, Stockport Council requires all shops to register their A boards. So uh, they're supposed to, be, supposed to be in line with bollards. So we know that this is an area of ongoing, potentially limited accessibility. This is a, just around the corner from Disability Stockport's building. So uh, as you can see, there's not really an accessible drop curb, no tactile paving. This is on the other side. So um, that's the other side of the street. So you can all see how that's problematic. But how do we map this? Do we map this? What kind of factors do we need to take into account? So this is what we kind of collected. This is what Stockport Council um, put together. So this is all the information that we collected within the scope of the project. So you can start to see hotspots along with that captured information. Uh, we can, this has been really useful for Stockport Council in planning their town centre redevelopment. And the documentation is potentially useful for those who want to use it, but perhaps not the most accessible, really. Um, unfortunately, this was as far as the scope of our project got. Um, but it, for me, it, it opened up a much wider question, which is something that I think there's a lot of discussion today about, which is can we make, can we make our maps and routing apps more inclusive, and how. So obviously, when planning to get from A to B, maps tend to um, give us the fastest or most efficient route, but they don't often take into account the wide variety of mobility and accessibility needs. So whilst there is plenty of information, there's lots of maps and apps that can help guide people around public buildings or transport systems, such as wheel map or sociability, 
a lot of these still operate on the assumption that people with accessibility needs just sort of can actually get to those locations in the first place. And with the case of Wheelmap, there's certainly not a lot of data in the UK on Wheelmap. This was a quote from Pete who has total blindness. Um, and he has his, his it, it, it's one of the best arguments I've seen for mapping the pavement. So to, to most people, the road is the same, whichever way you're going. But for me, each side of the pavement is a completely different terrain to learn. Um, I thought that was that was really, uh, really powerful observation. There are some examples in the UK, at least, of how it's being done. This is a map of Eastleigh that gives users an accessible route from the train station to the town centre. This is a community-built map uh, of Hebden Bridge. You can see it's co they've colour-coded the sidewalk, so you can get a sense of how easy or difficult certain terrains may be. Uh, likewise, this crowdsourced uh, map of Castle Fiorentina in Tuscany it has detailed colour-coded system for navigating the most accessible routes through the area. But but these are printed maps, <laughs> not much use in terms of sharing data. As you know, obviously, if you can't actually see or read. Um, what about digital routing software? We are starting to see a growth of awareness in the need to provide accessibility options, which is great, but whilst these haven't yet made it to perhaps the most commonly used routing and mapping apps yet, um, there are ventures like Project Sidewalk uh, or Access Map. I think they're, these are some quite good examples I've seen that I think are beginning to tip the balance, although coverage isn't widespread um, at present. Um, but it's also important to point out that these focus on mobility and accessibility, uh, uh, mostly just wheelchair or scooters and not other ones as well. So um, open route service, I think was discussed just now, shows promise, incorporates different wheelchair profiles, allowing you to make adjustments for your route preferences. But at present, it only caters for those in wheelchairs and scooters. And I've not actually been able to get this to work because as I think the gentleman said, the data is quite sparse. Okay, so there needs to be a greater awareness of the need to map mobility and accessibility in a more detailed way. Width of road, incline, camber, things like bollards, street signs in the middle of the pavement, these are permanent fixtures, fixtures that could be mapped. Um, and in my opinion, maybe, maybe should be. You know, no different to say drop curbs and just and tactile paving. Um, at the same time, if we're an able-bodied person like myself, um, we cannot presume to know what to look for and what to map, right? You know, uh, working to a consensus in a sort of Wikipedia style is really good, but is not the same as equality, is not the same as inclusion. Um, you know, with any consensus-based system, how do we make sure the voices of the marginalised are heard and included? It needs to be part of the design. Um, if you get it wrong from the start, then the systems itself may not be able to describe the experiences you want to describe. And I think that's really, really important. I think with the Mapping Mobility Project, it was a good pilot for a, a, a methodology that quickly and inclusively crowdsourced a lot of data on a very localised um, level. And I think that the OpenStreetMap community is you know, potentially in the best position to push this, to push this in the right direction. After all, you know, look how quickly it created what the, the most detailed crowdsource map of the world. And with its extremely flexible tagging system, there's absolutely no reason that some standards couldn't be developed for all manner of disabilities and needs. But just to hammer the point home, we have to be careful when presuming to map for people and not, not um, you know, not with them or by them, unless we are helping those communities to map for themselves you know, mapping with them, then we risk creating more biases, yeah? We, regardless of our intentions. Um, so, just some sort of next steps. Obviously, we need to, do need to think about how we describe different mobility impairments, um, different experiences, and this does need to be led, for, I think, from the communities themselves. We're not just talking about wheelchair users, we're talking visual impairments, acute neurological impairments, each with their own unique abilities and disabilities. And what we've seen is that, you know, what works for one person might not work for another person. Ideally, we want these communities to be uh, mapping for themselves. With the groups we work with, they simply don't use programs such as um, OSM. So there needs to be provision for training, that kind of thing. We're keen 
in Open Data Manchester to continue this project. All of our stuff is in the open. It's on our, on, it's on our GitHub. You can um, download what we did, your own methodology, and do it yourself. And if it's something that you want to replicate and try out in your community, or you have suggestions, then we'd love to talk to you. I'm around for the rest of the day. Um, yeah, Diane, I think that's it. So thank you very much. Thank you, Sam, for this interesting presentation. Do we have questions? I often find that anything that isn't a nuisance for me personally is um, not something I have the confidence to to put on the map. How would I? How could I address that? That's a really good question, um, and I think I think part of it is including the person, the people who might find that an obstacle. You know, as I say, we can't all. There are certain things that we know are there, like the drop curbs, tactile paving, are things that can be mapped. But I think you're right. If you're not entirely sure if you should map it because it might be an obstacle or a nuisance, then perhaps, you know, one element is to sort of not map it, but then the other element is maybe go and talk to a local charity or a local community group for who might be interested in to that sort of thing. Um, I'm assuming that part of your problem of moving on is about getting funding to do, carry on projects like this. Is there any interest from government? Yeah, that's a, <laughs> absolutely right. I mean, we're, I'm looking for ways to continue this in Stockport. There is another council in Greater Manchester, and I'm not going to say their name, because I don't want to drop them in it in case they pull out, but who are also who are interested in the project. They were interested in mapping um, sound auditory levels on certain streets for people perhaps on autistic spectrum who are affected by different sound levels. So we've actually been talking to them. So there is ways. We're looking, but yeah. <laughs> Good. Yeah. Well, I, I hope it gets used again by someone else because it's really important the stuff you're doing. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. Other questions? There's one down here. Uh, thanks for your presentation. It's really inspiring and uh, yeah, great to see the work that's going on up in Manchester. I was wondering, you mentioned earlier on that most people uh, you were working with hadn't necessarily heard of OSM uh, and tended to use things like Google Maps or Apple Maps. Mm. Is there a way for this data that you're collecting to find its way back into those products? To find, them, find this information over in, into Google and so on? Uh, that's a good question and that's not something that, I've, that we've looked at at this point. I think we've been mostly focusing on OpenStreetMap and the OpenStreetMap community. <laughs> Haven't looked at any of the wider ones. I mean, you know, you do tend to find that things that end up in OpenStreetMap do turn up in Google and Bing. And so I think part of it is because we come at it from a very community grassroots level, it feels to me like that's the best position to, the OSM community is the best one. And I think that's where the push can really come from actually if you're st and we are starting to see it as, a, as the previous talk you know there is more of an interest in accessibility uh, mapping accessibility providing accessibility routing i think that the all the best ideas get stolen right so if the open stream community is continues to do it in such a great way i think it wouldn't be long before we start to see it in in other more mainstream perhaps uh, the, mo the more common maps and apps if i can call them that yeah we have time for one more question. If that's not the case, let's thank uh, Sam again for making the world more accessible. Thank you. Thank you.